God's love running after us. And we, we talk so much about our need to go after God, and that's important. But it's important to remember that, you know, draw near to me, says the Lord, and I'll draw near to you.
dear Lord, we pause this day to remember the gift of life that you give. Let this day be filled with the riches of friendship and kindness and thoughts of you and all the good that you do. Lord, may we shine your light into a world that needs that light. We give this gift to you, Lord, as a token of our love. And we thank you for your care. Amen. Before we have our seat, let's just say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. So today in Abiding in the Vine, we're going to look at a virtue which, from the best of my understanding, is perhaps one of the most misunderstood virtues. And it probably has a lot to do with the way we use our language, the way we speak. When we think about virtues on Abiding in the Vine Sunday, you know, money and wealth, it has a place, but the things you can do with money, the things that you can have in life, they come and they go. But when we take the time to develop virtues, the virtues of God inside our heart, we're dealing with something that's eternal. Isn't that a beautiful thought? We're working on treasures that don't pass away. Now, when it comes to the scriptures, hope is is really given a beautiful place. In fact, I would say that, that most Christians understand that faith, hope, and love have some special place in the Lord. But what I want to show us today is hope is not what we thought it was. It's not the way we've used it. You know, I, I hope you had a lovely birthday, or I hope that that interview went well, or you know, you know, there's a kind of almost wishful thinking that's going into that use of the word hope. And it is not what the scriptures mean when it talks about hope. There's an element of that. There's an element of it because scripture says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. So there's an element of where hope is looking to something that is not yet so we, you know, I hope that goes well. There's that sense there. But it's not what hope, biblical, celestial hope is. We're going to dig deep into what hope is today. Let's, let's start by saying this. Hope needs to be developed. All virtues need to be developed in our life. But hope needs to be brought into our life kind of brick by brick by brick. Literally, we have to build hope into our lives. So if you're going to build a building, you have to start with a good, solid foundation. So help me out here for a moment. How might we develop hope in our lives? How might we build more hope into our lives? Suggestions? I know I'm throwing the thought out at you at the, the last minute. The idea is, Chris, what do you think? How do we bring more hope into our lives? Develop our trust in the Lord? Trust the Lord? Put our trust in the Lord, that's it, yeah. Deposit your trust in God, like a bank account, and it will bring good returns. Don't put it in man. That's a good one. Internally. Internally, sorry, Chris. Look internally. Look internally. internally all the time. Thank you. Because we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna give you four real simple steps to build more hope in your life today. And it does. It takes internal introspection takes that internal view if you're going to actually build hope properly. Any other thoughts about building hope? I mean, you go big picture. Okay, so we're going to build a house big, brick by brick. I give that lovely place. Before they could build it, they had to lay the foundation. They had to get it right. 
if they missed a bit, you wouldn't have that room there. So we lay a good foundation. And scripturally, our foundation is in... Sorry? The rock, Jesus Christ, is our foundation. The Word of God. The Lord. Have a look at this. I was thinking of you, Gay. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Isn't that beautiful? In other words, this foundational stone, Jesus Christ, this foundational stone in our life that builds hope, is the promises of God. Is it not? It is the promise of God. And the Lord did not fail as he promised to come in human form. But even more, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, that's the Lord in us, he is called the hope. He's called our hope. But I really want to, I really want to lay out a good map for you what, what hope really is. It, it, I would go so far as to say hope is the power of God. Hope is the power of God. So let's have a look. Anyone guess who that is? It's Viktor Frankl. He was a psychologist, a Jew, and he found himself during the war in quite a few of the concentration camps, one of them being Auschwitz. Is that how you'd say Auschwitz? Yeah, Auschwitz. And reflecting back on his time in, in, the, in the concentration camps, he wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. I found that a hard read, but a good read. Boy, there were some times where there's just incredible wisdom was just bubbling through in what he said. In fact, I go so far as to say he makes a conclusion in the book about halfway through the salvation of man. I've realized the salvation of man lies in love. And you, you hear that quite a, a bit with him because it's such a powerful love and in loving. But there's a context around that which is stunning. He talks about times where to, to, to deal with the, the hardships, his thoughts would go to his wife. He said she was almost there. He would be talking to her and she would talk back to him. And the very first time this happened, where he went into a really deep conversation with his wife, after he had this amazing conversation with her and he just felt so uplifted, a beautiful little bird, Ian, came and do you remember reading that? A beautiful little bird came and landed down as if confirmation that she's with him. Because he didn't know if she was alive or not. But he realized it didn't matter. At that point, love is the salvation of man. And he specifically was talking about the love between a man and a woman, that very special love. Powerful stuff. Very, very powerful. And there's a lot in this book about hope and hopelessness. If you think about we'll, we'll get there in a moment. we we'll go through the order of service. The opposite of hope. Think about what the opposite of hope is. If, it, if, if hope is the actual power of God, then you're going to find some very interesting opposites, aren't you? Very interesting opposites for that lack of that life and power of God in your life. So whatever answer you have in your head, it will be right. But there's a few ones that I want to focus on. Let's have a look at a few quotes quickly before we go to the order of service. The thought of suicide was entertained by nearly everyone. If only for a brief time, it was born of the hopelessness of the situation. The constant danger of death looming over us daily and hourly. And the closeness of death suffered by many of the others. So not only was he seeing people dying, starving or giving up, but there could have been typhoid or something else coming through as well. It wasn't just the, the, the way they were treated, it was sickness as well. And of course he told them, I'm a doctor. He always introduced himself as I'm a doctor. No one ever asked what kind of doctor. A psychologist and that ended up pushing him into places of favour, but he had to do a lot of things that were well beyond him in terms of medical care for people. He learned how to be a real doctor, even though, I shouldn't say a real doctor, a medical doctor, even though he was a doctor of psychology. It is a peculiarity of man that he can only live by looking to the future. What a profound insight. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. To give you a hope and a future. That's my plan for you, says the Lord. Looking to the future. Subspecies 
I don't know, Gay, can you pronounce that? Yeah, Eternitatis. Atter- yeah, that sounds good. I never saw the word eternity in there. Eternitatis, yeah. And that in his salvation, in the most difficult moments of his existence, although he sometimes has to force his mind to the task. Okay, so there, there is the building side of hope for me. It's brick by brick by brick. You know, if you're waiting for hope to just flood you, it doesn't work that way. You've got to build it brick by brick. You've got to put yourself to the task of building. Another quote. I think there's only two more. The prisoner who had lost his faith in the future, his future, was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also had a loss. He also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and become subject to mental and physical decay. He talks about one time where he was working out in the yard with another um, prisoner, and the prisoner looked up, and you could just see the sun sprinkling, mottling through the trees, just mottling through the trees, and then there was the fence. I read that, and I just got my heart sunk when I heard, I'm, I'm so caught up in his writing, and then he said, and the fence. <laughs> and the other prisoner said, this world could be so beautiful. Notice the word could. This world could be so beautiful. But there's another time he talked about where they were all inside doing something, and another inmate came running with whatever little strength he had and said, you've got to come and see this sunset. Isn't that amazing? In the midst of nothing. I was moved by that. In the midst of nothing, these prisoners <coughs> found the glory of God in the same things that free people do. I mean, isn't it? Don't you still, once you grab Brian, sometimes or Brian say, yeah, and you should see this. And there's a beautiful sunset moment. I love that golden moment. It doesn't happen every day, but you walk outside and everything's got a gold tinge to it in the afternoon. There's something beautiful about that. And he does talk, Victor talks about how it was actually in nature, Chris, that he could touch God and find hope. That was all they had. The nature that was around them. The beautiful hills of Bavaria and you know, the landscape. That's what they had. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing. The last of his human freedoms. To choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. To choose one's own way. And when, there's a point in the book where he says this, and I was thinking about it, and I began to think, what would have I done if I'd been in that prison? You know, I don't know what I would have done, but I know what I'd like to do. I'd like to see those prison guards as my friend, the children of God, not my enemy. It's too easy to think they're the enemy when there really is something much deeper going on in the hells, isn't it? And if we can keep that attitude, I think... That, that others would sense it, even if they were your um, guardians or prison, uh, your prison wardens or whatever, they would sense that you are treating them with that love. But you know, when, when you've got guards hitting you and poking you and calling you a pig, come on, pig, that was their favourite term for prisoners, pig. You know, and if someone fell over and others tripped over them, they'd whip them all. It's quite cruel. How do you how do you keep the right attitude? Because it's one thing someone can't take from you, isn't it? And Paul says that when he's in prison in the letters to the new church uh, to the New Testament church, he's saying to them, "Though I'm a prisoner for Christ, I'm free. I have a freedom in here that no one can take from me." Powerful stuff. Okay, so we're going to have a look at a moment in four steps, but. Let's go into the order of service first. Let's begin by, Gabe, would you read the front of the order of service? Hope is the inward conviction that good and truth will always triumph in the end. Hope is not wishful thinking, but an unshakable conviction that, that the divine is at work and will cause the best outcomes to manifest in one's life. Hope, therefore, as a spiritual virtue, is built upon godly convictions and spiritual faith. Thus, when goodness and truth are not currently manifesting in a set circumstance, the virtue of hope arises in the heart and mind, providing the desire and convictions to see things set aright. We experience fresh optimism and courage to continue toward our heart expectations. When hope is present, there is a determination to persevere, 
and the unwillingness to quit in the face of adversity. Hope eases our sufferings while strengthening our resolve to pursue the good and noble life of heaven. Yes. I mean, this is as good as a moment as any to try and start to map out for you what godly celestial hope really is. I think in the new church, too, it can get a little bit confusing for us because Swedenborg has worked so hard to establish a proper understanding of what faith is, right? What's faith? It is a conviction to live according to the knowledge and the wisdom of God, is it not? So there's a strong connection between faith and wisdom and knowledge and the conviction to live it. But having said that, faith has another aspect to it that can often be missed. Hebrews says it this way. It says, by faith, God formed the world. And the Lord even taught his own disciples and us, and he says, look, if you believe, if you speak to a, a mountain and tell itself to be plucked up and moved and dumped into the ocean, and you doubt not, you'll have what you say. And there are times where the disciples listening to Jesus said, oh, help, help us, Lord. Increase our faith. He said, you're not understanding me. He said, you don't need an increase in faith. In fact, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, yeah, that's all you need. So faith is not our problem. It's the blockages that gets in the way. And I like that example. I mean, if this was 240 volts of electricity, it's not, but if it was, why am I not getting electrocuted? Because it's insulated. And so too is God's life and power. It's insulated to keep protect us and keep us alive, but when we need its power, it needs a way out. And if I've got a knife on and I'm going to cut away, how much wire has to stick out before I get it? It's really. Not much. A mustard seed worth. That's what the Lord was trying to get at. You don't need more faith. You need to, to, to take the sword of the Spirit and cut away what's in your way. There's hope. Okay, there's hope. Now follow me here. If faith is a builder and you say, go build, what shall I build? Then hope is the blueprints that tells him what to build. We need to get them. We need to understand this because we understand that, that, that faith is how I must live my life. But there's another level. Paul said this way. He said, I no longer live this life by my strength. I live by the faith of the Son of God in me. Not the faith in the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Does that make sense? So we live by our faith convictions and then more and more of the faith of the Son of God is living and dwelling in us. And when we pray, there are results. But to pray in a way that faith can flow, that electricity needs wires. Just like the building needs a blueprint. And that's what hope is. Hope is the promises of God that we, un we learn, we understand and we build into our life. And it gives something for the life and faith of God to flow into it and build. Does is, is that make sense? And if you've got questions, I'm quite happy for people to say, but hang on, how does, how does that work? Will this work? But hopefully, I'm, ho hopefully you're getting an idea of how we've misunderstood this virtue. I'll say it again. I believe hope is the power of God. Going forth. Faith is the power of God, but faith needs something to flow into. Yeah, that's why visualization works. That's why every thought is a is a prayer. Every desire is a prayer. It's giving faith something to flow into our hopes, our dreams. So if I'm hoping on God, but I'm picturing the worst, am I really believing and not doubting, as Jesus said? So how am I going to believe? To tell a mountain to move, and I got friends of mine who were pastors, and they said that they were doing some earthworks and big pile of dirt out the front. And his wife said, "Well, it says this in the Bible, Lord. I command that pile of dirt to be moved in Jesus' name." Now I know that there's an extreme in this, but later that day there was a knock on the door, and a builder down the road said, "Did you want that dirt? Because I could really use it." And he came and took it all away. 
Right? So there, there, yeah, I know we can get a bit super spiritual here, but there is a reality here to what we're visualising up here, to what we're feeling in here. Is it built brick by brick on the hope and promises of God, or is it built on our fears and our doubts? And the scripture says a double-minded man can't be blessed. It just doesn't work that way. Electricity is non-discriminant. It doesn't say, I really like you, so I won't electrocute you. It just doesn't work that way, is it? I mean, God is, is, is in, in our favour, but he's giving us wisdom and teaching us. Okay, so I think I'm labouring the point here enough. Faith is not wishful thinking. Sorry, hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is the promises of God building up inside us in an expectation of good and true. Yeah? All right, let's move on. Uh, taming our life. Sorry, yeah, go in, go. Go in. Experience of God that we step by step accumulate. Is that what you're saying? Hope is built by experience. I mean, a good builder has good experience and builds a good building. Hope is expectation of good and truth. But, but, but to have those right expectations of good and truth, we have to have a right knowledge of what is good and what is true. Which is why we go back to the promises of God. They're yes and amen. They're not promises to hurt us, but to give us a hope and a future. Interesting, because from an artistic point of view, to have, they're always saying, all thumbnails, sketches, just the whole size and develop and get bigger to do the actual painting. So what you're saying to me is you need a plan, a structure, which is faith. Well, truth is faith is what's going to make the artwork happen, but faith needs hope to work into, to flow into. That's that plan. Does faith flow into hope? I thought hope flowed into faith to give it structure. I mean, without... without Hope. There's no point in any structure. No. There's no faith. No. Which you is, have to have hope. It's, it's that's yes. the motivation to start. When we say structure, think of the desired end. The desired. What? Because yes. faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Does that make sense? So we're hoping we, we have a vision or a hope of what's coming, and faith can flow into that. But people without a vision perish. There's no way for faith to flow. It sits dormant in the marketplace saying, who will hire me? Did you see that? I think it's a piece of words. Use of words. Keep working with it. We'll keep going. We've had this misuse of hope for so long, Gay, that it's a wishful thinking. We've got to understand that... that um, Hope is not... When God built the world, he had a hope. But his hope was not, oh, gee, Gabriel, I hope this works. His hope was, it's going to be like this, and it's going to be like that. And it is going to be like this, and it is going to be like that. He gave it structure. He gave, gave it hope structure. Mm -hmm. But we've got to... We're coming up Jacob's ladder, not down. So we've got to start by laying the wires and drawing the blueprint for the Lord to build Does that? Yeah, you're getting it but I like the way you think because you're thinking from a heavenly perspective down it, you know we're working with the process coming up okay thank you so much any other comments or thoughts on that before you Jane uh, just when you say oh I hope you have you have a nice day or whatever that's my heartfelt desire like I think I could substitute I pray you have a nice day yes so is that hope or not like I, it's still hope but it's on the most external level and and when we get to the higher level what we understand about hope is that you are wishing well for her but on the higher level it's not a wish it's a knowing that this is going to be because God is good and true and they're the only things that are real. So it's that conviction. That's why I said on the front here, right on the front here, it's a conviction that good and truth are what are meant to be and whenever we don't see good and truth, the desire is to make that good and truth come into reality. Let thy will be done as in heaven. So on earth, we're bringing it into the ultimates. You know, from God's perspective, it's already done. 
It's all done. But we're co-workers and he wants us to stay the course with him. Does that help a little bit, Shane? And what that, I think it's nice that you brought that up because we're not... I don't want to... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Invalidate those genuine charitable feelings that you have. But we want to understand that on a higher level, hope is a conviction that something is going to be. And that's what faith can flow into. Yeah. But it still needs a picture. It needs a cla- it needs you to formulate what that being is. What it's, you know, which is why heaven is not actually from the Lord, it's from man. The Lord through man. Does that make sense? It's the be- it's the most beautiful thing that God can bring into reality through mankind. And hell is the worst. Okay. So Coming back to it on a more natural on the more natural level, let's take a moment to think about what might life be without hope. Hope we all have feelings of hopelessness at times around certain things, but what would life be like if we just didn't have hope? Think of a time when someone spoke into your life and they renewed your dreams and your hopes. How much does hope play a part in your out- life outlook? very powerful, isn't it? We've never done anything in life without faith and hope. So faith is the power, hope is the vision of what the power is going to do. And you need them both. You know, we talk about the visible God versus the invisible. Hey, you can't extend love out to an invisible God. But the visible God gives us that ability to... So that's hope. That's why Christ is the hope of God manifested. Jesus Christ is God's hope manifested. We'll see that as we go on. Uh, definitions. Gabe, would you read some definitions? A feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. A feeling of trust. You want something to happen or be the case. That's a nice dictionary definition it's, and some synonyms. Achievement, ambition, anticipation, aspiration, belief, concern, confidence, desire, expectation, faith, goal, optimism, promise, prospect, wish, assumption. Mm. What stood out for me that time was how the dictionary just kind of pushes faith and hope together into one thing. Which is interesting, you know, it tells us a little bit more about it. But we know that they're one and yet they're separate. Yeah. Did something did jump something jump out for anyone else there? Yeah, yeah. Which one? Expectation. Expectation. It's grounded. It's grounded. I like that. It's gra- it's not conviction, it's grounded, like wired in and grounded to conviction. Very hard to separate these things. You know, when you look at a, a brand new smartphone, it's one thing. But wait till you pull them apart. 50 billion little things. <laughs> and, and faith and hope are like that. They're one thing, but they work together. And you know what they work through more than anything? Charity. Love. Love. Beautiful. Okay, so and antonyms. I love antonyms because I always feel, you know, the mountains are made more beautiful by the valleys and when we get to the opposite of something, it really tells us something about what we're looking at. Disbelief, dislike, distrust, doubt, fear, hate and hatred. Wow. So let's go, let's stop there for a moment and go to the card. Because when we think about the opposite Think about the opposite of hope. What was coming up in your mind? Did everybody have something a little bit different? Did you have anything, die of what the opposite of hope is? Uh, hopelessness. Hopelessness. Uh, so beautiful, big, and nebulous. <laughs> hopelessness. But we all know that feeling of dread, don't we? Yeah. Hopelessness is a dread, isn't it? Is that what you meant, like a dread? Yeah. Yeah, dread. Yeah. Negativity. Negativity. Excellent. Negativity. Despair. Despair. But it's interesting that they've got hate and hatred. Because you think that's the opposite of love. Bingo. Yeah. Hate. Who would have thought hate is the opposite of hope? Absolutely. That's There's no charity in hate. Well, but, but, but yeah, hate is definitely the opposite of charity. But it's just amazing how faith and hope flow into love. So you can't separate hate as an antonym, can you? The one that really spoke to me was fear. Let's have a look at the card. Fear. 
fear. It's easy to identify when you're in fear, isn't it? And the beautiful thing about it, and we get to the four steps, I'll come back to Let's have a look at this first. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the child where he is. This is when uh, Ishmael has been sent away with Hagar. And she's crying because she thinks her son's going to die. And the angel says, fear not. I, did, I counted fear not once, and it was nearly up, it was about 300 times in the Bible. I was hoping there'd be 365 times, because <laughs> there's that saying. But it was over 300 times, fear not. And then I realized, don't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing, you know? Don't let your heart be troubled. I can guarantee there is over 365 times the Bible says, don't be afraid. One for every day of the year. Don't be afraid. Because we're meant to have, instead of fear, we're meant to have hope. Hope of a future. Hope. Fear not, for God has heard the the, the voice of the child where he is. Genesis 21, 18. That this signifies the hope of hell is evident from the signification of fear not as being not to despair. For where fear is taken away, hope is present. You can't be in fear and hope at the same time. Where fear is taken away, wow, that's a weapon to fight fear. Hope is a weapon to fight fear. But it's going to come one brick at a time. Because when I say this to you, the Bible is nothing but the promises of God, especially in the inner sense. It's all promises. Don't we like that, don't we? And we talk about ten commandments, and then when we get up and preach, we say, ten promises. Thou shalt not hope. I think that we've got the, the first year of Venice working on that, on that brick lane. But as you said, they perfect the trade as yeah. time goes on. Yeah. Sometimes we feel like, I mean, with the climate today, Oh, yeah. The hope is... It's, it's oh, dead. walls are being knocked down, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. It's rebuilding, <laughs> renovating. Yes. But it's only because we have a bit of structure, isn't it? Mm. Ah, she loves this art of the faith. Love this you can hold, that, hold on to that. That's great. But here's the thing. Look, it's, it's cyclic. It's a journey, isn't it? And, you know, and when you finish the house and you're living in it, you think nothing else of it. But then when you know an accident happens and someone's car runs into the wall or the garage and you've got to fix it then you start thinking so in the same way as you say we've had a tough two years but what we need to do is we need to identify when we're in fear so let's go here four steps identify fear right this is the best way to build because you can't have the two present fear is faith in something bad happening something negative happening isn't it which is a ridiculous thing to say. When, when you think about it, it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> faith fear. in fear. Jesus said, have faith and you will see it. But it's equally true, have fear and you will see it too. The thing I fear came upon me, said Job. I don't like that book, but it has a very powerful message. The thing I feared came upon me. Okay, identify the fear. Two, search the word around that fear. What kind of fear you're dealing with? Search the word. There are hundreds of promises for all kinds of fears. Then you've got to, when you find those promises, practice them. Just write them down, share them, repeat them to yourself, affirmations, however you want to do it. I think a good one is write it and put it on your mirror so when you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, you're seeing it says, you know, uh, fear not, for I am with you. Let's say you're about to go and do an amazing presentation to the art group down the road and you're getting all that horrible feeling, you know. Then you go, I've got nothing to fear. The Lord is with me. Fear not, for I'm with you. Bang! You just built another brick in the wall of hope, in the building of hope. And that's and we're meant to live from that, live out of it. Hope is the power of God. Exercise. And then, of course, the last one, last step, is to go out and act according to the hope, not the fear. Or as some people say, feel the fear and do it anyway. But I'm, not, I'm saying arm yourself with hope as you do it. Arm yourself with a promise. There will be a promise to address your fear, whatever it is. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Ian, sorry, go ahead. Yes. I 
have the courage to have more fear. Yes. So many of them allow themselves to be overwhelmed. overwhelmed Look, there was a there was a few times towards the end where they had some false promises of getting out, like the war had come right to to the camps, and they thought they were that a deal had been done and they were getting out. There was a couple of times where a whole truck took them all away and said, you, you're being, the SOS came in and said, you're being freed. And to, he and the other, his friend, who had just planned to break out minutes earlier when they buried the third body they had to bury, and the doctor said, I'm so sorry, I forgot to put your name on the list. You're stuck here with me. Well, it turned out they, they saw pictures days later that those, so, those prisoners had been taken somewhere and burned alive. But there were so many times. But I noticed again that Victor Frankl said he made little promises to himself. I'm going to keep him alive. That became his hope. It was a future. It was a goal. It was something he was focusing on. And it kept him alive. <laughs> Incredibly. So it's, it's, it's about having that future and that hope and that promise in the middle of all this negativity. So let's go to the back first. And we'll finish these quotes. But I just want us to have a look. Fear, and another big one with fear for me is this negativity that you're talking about, Chris. Let's have a quick read. Look, I'll read the first bit, and then I'll let Gabe read the second bit. And it was so, and they, as they were emptying their sacks, and behold, each man's bundle of sil silver was in his sack. So this is a story where uh, Joseph called his sons to Egypt. Joseph was ruling Egypt, and they didn't know that Joseph was even alive. He was dressed like a pharaoh. And his sons, his brothers, sorry, came, and he was giving them food for for uh, for money for silver, and then he put the silver back in their sacks. So they've gone home and found, oh wow, we're going to be in big trouble because the silver's been put back in our sack, and surely someone's going to accuse us of stealing. And so it was that they emptied their sacks, and behold, each man's bundle of silver was in his sack, and they saw their bundles of silver. Now think about the spiritual significance there, and their fathers. And they were afraid. And now here's something that Jacob put in. Uh, sorry, Josh, Joseph put in the sack to bless them, and they got afraid. How often are we emptying ourselves out? Oh Lord, this is troubling. That's troubling me. Please help me with this. And silver comes up, some special promise of the Lord, and we become even more fearful. We've got to trust. Hold on to the promises. Don't let the enemy turn the promises of God into something that makes you even more fearful. He said, And Jacob and their father said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. And you take Benjamin? Uh, we're going to find out what Joseph and Simeon mean too in a minute. It's powerful stuff. But you, you want to go back to Egypt and take Benjamin with you? He said, Make my two sons die if I do not bring them back to you. Give, my, give him into my hand and I will bring him back to you. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead. And he, he alone, is left. And should harm happen to him on the road on which you go, you will cause my grey hair to go down in sorrow to the grave. So poor Jacob, he's, he just wants some food and his sons have gone off to Egypt to try and get some food and they come back with silver looking like they've stolen. Oh, we'll make it right, Dad. No, you've done enough. I've lost Joseph. I've lost Simeon. Do you want to destroy the church and take Benjamin too? That's what's really going on here. Would you like to read that to us, Gaga? What Secrets of Heaven tells us? In sorrow to the, to the grave. But this signifies without hope of resuscitation is evident from the signification of sorrow here as being without hope. For when there is no longer any hope, there is sorrow. And from the signification of the grave as being resurrection and regeneration. Okay, before we go on, so we're seeing here that the opposite of hope, you know, godly hope, is sorrow. Isn't it? Because of what we're, what we're losing out on. I mean, if you have a friend and you really think they've gone to hell, if you think they've died and gone to hell, you'll be filled with sorrow. But if there's a hope that, that the Lord has found a way for them, then you're filled with joy for them, isn't it? Yeah. 
But then he's about to talk about the church now. You know, is the church doomed? Well, it sure looks that way at times or feels that way with the things going on. But what does the promise of God say? He says he's coming back to raise up a new church, or in other words, to bring New Jerusalem down to earth. That's the promise. So just read that last little bit for us. That's the resuscitation of the church. For if in the church there is neither an internal, which is Joseph, nor an intermediate, which is Benjamin, nor faith in the will or charity, which is Simeon, there is no longer any hope of its resuscitation. Wow. And we're getting some insight into what the Lord struggled with when he was on earth. The temptations he would have gone through would have been tremendous. What if this work I'm doing fails and I lose the whole church? He would have felt the weight of that at times. You know, the sweating blood. If this fails, they're all doomed. Now, as God, he knew he wasn't going to fail, but as man, he was feeling the despair and the sorrow that this might not work. That's the temptation that he was going through. And isn't that how we feel at times? You know, like, is my life really going to work? Is it, what if, you know, what if it amounts to nothing? After all this, and I find out that to God it was dust, not gold and silver like I thought. And you go through a temptation in that way. Okay, so... What I really want to bring out of that passage was the idea that fear is a real powerful indication that you're not in hope. But so is sorrow. So take that with you this month. Try and catch yourself in fear or sorrow and say, ah, what am I sorrowful about? And there will be a promise of God to answer that fear or to answer that sorrow. Your challenge is to find it in the scriptures, to dig it up, talk to someone, find it, and then hold on to it. Remind yourself and act according to that, not according to the sorrow or the fear. Challenge, yes. So I've written that there on the back there this month. Look to identify any fear. Address it with hope and the promises of God from the Word. Keep those promises before you constantly as you build the virtue of hope in your life. So now let's go back to the readings. We just want to have a look at a few quotes and a few beautiful passages from the Word taking us a little bit deeper into this mysterious virtue called hope. The structure of things that faith wants to flow into. <laughs> Go on, Gay, read us uh, some, some of these beautiful quotes, Brad Henry. A good teacher can inspire hope, ignite the imagination, and instill a love of learning. Beautiful. So said Brad Henry. Mm. Hope lies in dreams, in imagination, and in the courage of those who dare to make dreams into reality. Mm. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Isn't that powerful imagery? Yeah. Emily Dixon. <laughs> the very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for. And the most you can do is live inside that hope. Not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its roof. Wow. Powerful. Hope can be a powerful force. Maybe there's no actual magic in it, but when you know what you hope for most and hold it like a light within you, you can make things happen, almost like the magic. Oh, sounds like faith, doesn't it? It's really a wonder that I haven't dropped all my ideals because they seem so absurd and impossible to carry out. Yet I keep them because in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Diary of a young girl, isn't that powerful? Beautiful. Young girl. Wow. Corinthians, we, but now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So Paul's saying there, you know, we've got a bit of light, we've got a bit of spiritual practice going on here, we know the Lord is saving us and we're working towards that, but it's still very dark at times. But he's saying, I promise you this, these three are God. Faith, hope and love are God. And the most important is the love or the charity. Beautiful. Uh, Romans? Is that, no, Jeremiah. Oh, we go on, Jeremiah. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The Lawsuits, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, I've got to stop there because I so much want to preach right now about this. Look at this wording here, right? To whom God would make known. 
What is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles? What is this mystery among the Gentiles? It's Christ in you. We say in the church, the Holy Ghost. The Lord living as dwelling in us through his Holy Spirit. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And of course you get your Texan Southern Christian Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The hope of glory. And they think of the resurrection. No. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. No, no, no. Christ is in us now. The hope of seeing thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We, you know, we, we sort of want to put it off into the afterlife. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. There will be the hope of that glory. But Christ is living in us right now so we can love each other. We can change this world. We can make it a better place. We can shine his light. That's hope. We're here to be a hope in a world that's hopeless. Desperately hopeless. Okay, well, I'll stop there. Keep, keep going. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Wow. Bound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. They're the same thing. He wants us to dream. He wants us to believe. He wants us to visualize. And he can flow into that with his love and power. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Beautiful. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That last one's beautiful, isn't it? So the Lord wants to give us revelation and enlightenment, the spiritual sense of the word. Why? So we can know the hope. The hope of being Christ in you and living a God life, a good life, a heavenly life. How beautiful. Let's read this meditation together. Everyone, I seek to be transparent with all. I love and seek the truth in all matters. I am quick to admit my mistakes and failures. I keep my word and make promises carefully. I am honest with myself, seeking genuine humility. I am thankful, Lord, for the gift of honesty. It teaches me the path of contentment and integrity in all situations. Let's pray together. Lord, you live in my heart. Not just so that you can comfort me, but that your hope of love, of care, of salvation can come from my life and touch those around me. Lord, I may not be a great vessel, but you are a great God. And I look to you, to your power, and to your promises. Fill me with hope, Lord, a hope of the future, of a good growing church, of families that are thriving, hearts that are healing, where love is abounding. Amen. So some challenges there for this, this month. Spot the fear. Spot any feelings of sorrow or sadness. Seek a promise that answers that and hold on to it and act from that. I'm going to put on a new commandment for us while I close the word. Yeah.
upon you and lift up his countenance upon you and the Lord grant you his everlasting peace.